Good evening and welcome to this edition of Turp Talk Football. I'm Wayne Viner. Joining me today is Lamont Jordan. He of Maryland football fame. And just like every podcast and video, this is brought to you by the Jack Litch Law Group, the big dog himself. You can reach them at 301-381-1222. And your hometown Terrapin IT team, Viner Forgates. If you need help with your computers, with your cybersecurity, call Viner Four Gates. You can reach them locally at 301-251-2900. So Maryland coming off a win where they had it on the scoreboard, might not have been as dominant as I would have liked, but Lamont was covering that game uh, against Towson from the field. So Lamont, welcome in to Trip Talk. What's going on? Thanks for having me, man. I know it's been uh, we've been trying to do this for a while. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I'm finally able to to to, uh, to do this with you. Yeah. Well, before we get into the game, the last time I was talking to you, you were a running backs coach in in which league was that? You were out in San Diego, weren't you? Oh yeah, the AAF uh, Alliance of American Football. Um, Mike Martz was the head coach. Um, had a great opportunity to to. Work with one of the best coaching staffs, in my opinion, ever assembled. I've <laughs> been out there with him. Um, had a great time, great weather. I uh, had been coaching youth football, coached a little bit of high school football. And um, I had an opportunity to, to coach under Coach March twice with the NFL Collegiate Bowl. And so once he had that opportunity, um, I must have did a great job working with him in the Collegiate Bowl because he brought me on as, as his running backs coach. Excellent. And then you're still involved with the Jets. Uh, you were involved with the Jets podcast. So you must be happy with what's going on with the Jets. Oh, yeah, man. I, I Listen, uh, Andrew, my co-host and I, for the last two years, we've, we've been following the Jets since Robert Sala took over. And, um, um, you know, he's done a great job of changing the culture there. Coming into the offseason, I said it, if we're going to spend money on any quarterback, the only quarterback I want us to spend money on is Aaron Rodgers. Um, that happened. He's he's one of my favorite quarterbacks. I still have him as the number two best quarterback in the National Football League right now. I know a lot of people going to probably frown on that, but I don't care. Um, I feel good about the Jets this year. I'm really excited to cover the team this year. Um, and I think the Jets are going to do some special, special things this year. All right. So I saw you on the field on Saturday. You're back in the Maryland radio booth. Uh, I'll go with what was your take on the 38 to six win over Dawson? Um, man, well, first of all, you know, it's my first time working the sideline. Um, I, I think one takeaway from that game that I had to realize is that I have to get in better shape because I was exhausted <laughs> after the game walking up down the steps. I love to watch the offense from behind. So I, it gives me uh, an opportunity to see what the pocket looks like. Um, whether the running backs are missing holes, things of that nature. Um, I was a little disappointed with the score um, because I really thought that we were going to come out there and give it to Towson, but I take my hat off to Towson's defense. You know, that defensive line, they really got after our offensive line. Um, and, yeah, we made a lot of mistakes there, but, you know, the good thing about football is that you play one week, you go back for a week, watch the film, practice, get ready for your next opponent, and the goal is to be better than you were last game. Um, I actually went up, you know, went and watched and broke down the film from from the Towson game. And um, I, I can kind of see why the score was, was wasn't as high as it was. But it also makes me excited knowing that once these guys get better, we're going to put up more points. I looked at the Towson game and I spent most of it on the field taking pictures. That Maryland, although they had the 38 points and a 32 point win. They weren't as dominant as I hoped that they could be. It actually reminded me of last year's Charlotte game that was at Charlotte. Maryland certainly won on the scoreboard, but I didn't feel they physically imposed their will uh, either in Charlotte last year or on Saturday against Towson. And I'm not sure if that's a style thing or that the offensive line just hasn't really had a chance to gel yet but I would like to see a little more physical domination. And that, and to me, that's going to lead to a bigger margin on the scoreboard. Um, so you said you watched the running backs. What did you see? Uh, Maryland has some highly rated running backs there, uh, led by number 24. What did you see out of that position? 
Um, those guys missed some cuts, you know, especially going back and watching the film. It was confirmed watching the film what I saw on game day is that I, these guys just missed some cuts. I think they had some home runs that were out there that they missed. Um, and when you look at today's game, it's totally different than when I came up. When I came up, we had I mean, my first my first year as a freshman at Maryland. We had three a days um, and, and not saying that you need to have three a days, but you 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 do need to hit when you're in practice. And that's the one position that I think suffers is the running back position. Um, this was our first time, actually, I believe, really going full throttle. And it's natural. Sometimes you're going to miss those cuts. Um, um, but 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 I think those guys will get better. They're definitely going to get better. I agree with you with regards to the offensive line. You know that those guys need to gel. And I think that that was that's really the weakest part of our team right now is our offensive line. Um, I don't know if it was just Towson was dom was was just that good or our guys were just that soft. Sometimes you could, you know, it's, it's a scheme thing. But if these guys just make the right cut on a couple of these plays, then you're talking about us scoring way more points than we score. So these are things that they know. These are things that the offensive line knows. And and those guys really have to get it together because it's as simple as this. What you put out there on film is going to give your next opponent an idea of what they're about to face. And right now, based off of that first game, if 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 I'm a coach and I'm looking at the Maryland's offensive line, I'm saying, hey, we can win this game because we can dominate those guys. And so um, that's something that they're going to have to get fixed. And I look forward to seeing, you know, you know, how much better did they get this week compared to last week? Well, I I would expect to see some growth. I also thought that in the passing game, even though Leah I read so much about the fact that he has a better deep ball under through a couple of deep balls or he was late on letting it go. And hopefully, hopefully that gets worked out because I think that Prather, Caden Prather, who's a tall wide receiver transferred in from West Virginia. He's from Montgomery village, Maryland. That guy can go up and, and out jump probably most, if not all the cornerbacks that are playing right now. If those two, if Leah, and Caden Prather, get on the same page. Watch out. Yeah, uh, I, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I agree with you. Um, you know, that, that's the other thing that when you look at the score, while we didn't score a, a, enough points, I think there were two or three times that he underthrew guys. Um, there was one time to, um, I think it's Felton. Felton uh, dropped the touchdown pass. Uh, he was running right at me. I got great pictures. He just didn't catch the ball. Yeah, I mean, that, that that was a dime. The one thing that Talia has shown me is that when you give him time, that he can he, he can deliver the ball accurately. Um, but it also comes back to the offensive line. You know, you were standing down there just as I was standing down there. Talia was taking some shots. He was. He got he, beat up. Yeah. And early on, it, it really was taking a beating. And then he seemed to find his rhythm and not get hit as much as the game went on. Yeah, he did. And, and part of that was because of his ability to work in the pocket. But those are things that will affect the quarterback. Like if you're getting hit, you know, that will affect your timing. Sometimes you're not going to be willing to step into the ball because you're cringing. And so um, and then you also have to take into account the drop passes. There were a couple of times that I think that his eyes were in the wrong place. He did have guys open. But he was looking to one side of the field and the guy who was open was on the opposite side of the field. But again, these are things that the coaching staff is going to get corrected. I'm sure that he's going to get that corrected. And the way that you help out, in my opinion, the way that you help out an offensive line is is you use your running backs. You run downhill at these guys. You get consistent with it. And that's something that Coach Locke said going into the locker room at halftime when I interviewed him was that he wanted to go. He wanted to come out the second half and get the run game going. From the time that I've been in Maryland, the run game, in my opinion, has always been the backbone, has always been the heartbeat of, of the Maryland team, the Maryland offense. And so we have some great wide receivers. Um, and and I think once we get our run game going and teams start focusing more on our run game, once they start having to drop that extra guy in the box, I think that's going to make things a lot easier for our passing game. I Absolutely agree with that. There were times when Towson lined up and, and what zero coverage. They went man to man on the outside and they had nine or 10 guys in the box. 
And that's a heck of a risk to take against a guy who can throw it like Leah can throw it. And those were a couple of the occasions where Prather got to go one-on-one downfield. So if you're going to try that as a defense, chances are uh, the defense is going to lose and Maryland's going to win enough of those to make you get out of that defense and go back to a more basic look. Defensively, Maryland has the beef up front. I don't know if they're going to play like it, but if you go out and take a look at the Maryland defensive front, they do look like a Big Ten size defensive front to me. Is that what you're seeing? Did you get to focus on the defense while you were covering the game? Yeah, I mean, I was able to focus on, on, on all aspects of the game. It was hard to really lock in on what our defense can do because I just think that they went out there and dominated Towson from a defensive standpoint. I mean, if you look at the stats, you look at what Towson was able to do, majority of their yards came from their running back scrambling. Um, so if I'm looking at things from a defensive perspective and Brian Williams, he's done a great job. When you look at this defense, this defense is very stingy when it comes to um, they're, they're selfish when it comes to to allowing you to get into the end zone. I mean, they haven't given up a touchdown in, I believe, three games in a quarter dating all the way back to Ohio, back to uh, the fourth quarter against Ohio State. They haven't given up a touchdown. And so I, I definitely expect this defense to be dominant. I love our secondary. I think we have tall corners. Um, I'm a huge fan of Steel. I, I've been a fan of his since 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 I first watched him put on a uniform. Mm-hmm. Uh, the defense is going to be fine. I'm not overly concerned with the defense. Um, I, I don't really think that we're going to see where our defense is until we play Virginia. But I fully expect that we'll go out here against Charlotte. And I think that this is another game where our defense can keep a team out of the end zone. So, and then you also have to look at the fact that Coach Locke started sub, started substituting guys in early. I mean, you're talking about the second, third drive. You you have backups. You have second and third stringers that were going in there. And so, uh, didn't really uh, mention Hippolyte's name a lot. No, throughout. he didn't play as much as I thought. They played a lot of Caleb Wheatland. Yeah, uh, Barham played. A lot. He wears number one. He he is the defensive star, or the system set up to make him the defensive star. But you look at the defensive line, and you start with Tommy Aking Basote, who has waited. Now it's his third year. He looks like a defensive tackle. He's 315 pounds. They bring in Phillips, transferred in from Tennessee. He's got the right size. And you go, okay. You you let's go to the bench. You go great. We have uh, it's a Tyshay Johnson. Mm-hmm. who is in his third year, where's number 40. He's got to be 340 pounds. And they bring in uh, Bunyan, who is in his fifth or sixth year, and he brings pass rush from the defensive tackle position. They're stacked in the middle. Usually, Maryland might have had one or two players of that size. Now you have, really, if you look at even the, there's more guys who transferred in. I think the fellow wears number 93, a uh, fellow who transferred in, Trey Colbert, 333 pounds. He's from Temple, Texas. He comes in. You've got the size that you need, hopefully, to stop the run in the Big Ten. And if you can stop the run, you know how good that defensive backfield is. You bring up Tarheeb, still, you bring up Trader. You talk about Bo Braid. Uh, the corner that came in on the other side from Cincinnati looks phenomenal. Yeah. So you've got you get pretty much have four shutdown defenders on the backside. That's Jaquan Shepard, who's six yeah. two. He might be one of the few guys that could cover one on one against Prather. So it's good to have him. And then there's a bunch of guys that played last year. Uh, Gavin Gibson comes to mind, who had l- legitimate time in that backfield last year, uh, who are there to sub in the backs. Like I said, the back end of the defense looks good. The front. Part of this defense looks good, and let's see if these linebackers, Hippolyte, Wheatland, can actually play at the Big Ten level and both rush the passer and cover out of the backfield. If you can do that, these linebackers come through. I think you have something really special defensively. Yeah, you do. And, you know, there's another guy, there's a true freshman out there, Daniel Wingate. He got a little bit of playing time. Um, I think that he's a guy that everybody, if you're a Terps fan, that you, you should keep your eye on. Because that kid is going to be good. I had an opportunity to coach him in high school um, when I was the head coach of Riverdale Baptist his freshman year. He was my starting tight end and my starting um, middle linebacker. He got in. He got in the game, 
he was actually in on some tackles. He was out there making plays. We have a lot of young, a lot of good young players. When you look at this defense, we only have five returning starters from this defense. And so when you're talking about depth, when you're talking about getting an opportunity to play, when you only have five starters returning, there's a lot of competition in practice. I did have an opportunity to check out the defense um, one time this offseason. I love the way those guys were flying to the ball. I think when it comes to the defense, it's going to come down to them being disciplined. Part of the reason that the Towson quarterback was able to um, pick up the yards that he picked up, A, the, 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 the refs missed a blatant hold on one of those calls, on one of those long runs he's had. But they just have to be disciplined in their rush lanes. I think that if we can get enough pressure on the quarterback and, for, and, and disrupt the quarterback's timing, I think that our secondary can come away with a lot of takeaways this year. And you talked about the, you talked about the beef that we have up front. That's going to allow our linebackers to run free and make plays. And then it just comes down to those guys tackling and making plays. And so um, I'm really excited about the defense. When I was coaching, I always told my defensive coordinator this. The first three or four games, it's on you all. When you're trying to gel together a bunch of new pieces on the offensive side of the ball, especially the offensive line, you need your defense to play lights out. And, and I really think that Coach Williams has the defense playing lights out. Um, those guys just have to continue to do that, and they just have to make sure that they show up this week against Charlotte. All right, I got to bring up one more offensive player, which is Corey Deitches, who looks like the next NFL tight end at Maryland, which is a long line of tight ends. Maryland does well putting defensive backs and tight ends into the league. Did Have you seen enough to say that this guy can find a spot on an NFL roster? I think when I look at tight ends, for me, first and foremost, like I, I know the league has gone to the tight end being this guy that can run out and run routes and catch the ball. And that's mm-hmm. something that Deitches does very well. And I think that he's also dangerous with the ball after he catches it. But the one area that I see that our tight ends have to get better at is pass protection and run blocking. I will uh, go with that run blocking 100%. I asked him after the game. He said he's worked on that all off season, But it, it's a strange art because people who can go out and catch the ball and could be a wide receiver, often – the blocking is is just it just doesn't come naturally. I don't know you know a lot more about that than I do. So shed some color on this. Yeah, blocking is a one two. And when you're playing a tight end position, you're in the trenches. And so sometimes what I've seen is with with the tight ends that, you know, they catch your eye because they do a great job in the passing game, they tend to have the mindset of wide receivers. Now, if you could take a, a, a Jay Sean Jones, who's a wide receiver, but if you look from the time that every time he's on the field and they're running the ball, I mean, he is heavily involved in, in the run game. I mean, he, he's a guy that I would love to have on my team because the rules allowed him to block the way that he blocks. I mean, he got he got a couple of 15 yard penalties last year simply because he was out playing some some real football. And so I was going to bring that up. He blocks so well that the referees know who he is every yeah, they, game. They're looking for him. They know who he is. And so you you, you got to have your tight ends to have that same mentality. Listen, I get it. You're playing against some defensive ends that are bigger than you. I'm a running back. And on certain pass protections, I have to block three techniques. And sometimes you can't cut them, but you have to go in there, bite down on your mouthpiece. It's going to be nasty. It's going to hurt. But that's what you sign up for when you're playing in the trenches. And so – um, I think for a tight end position, yes, it's good that you can run routes and you can catch the ball. But, you know, in order for our offense to take things to the next level, we need our tight ends to be more dominant in blocking both running and passing. That is very well put. So I do have to hit the the way back machine. Uh, I should have looked up what year it was, but it was a long time ago. <laughs> One of the best games that I've ever seen was a Maryland-Virginia game that that ended a season. And that's the game that, uh, I guess it was 35-34, UVA takes it in the end. But the day that you had as a running back for Maryland, um, 306 yards, was it? Yep. Yep, 306 and uh, three touches, I believe. Three touchdowns, yep. Um, And they put Randall Jones, the running quarterback, back in and teamed up with you. And, you know, I probably could do an hour on that game. It was one of the most, it it was beautifully played. 
that's the type of rivalry game that, that you'd look for today and really point to. That's back when the ACC days. But what a uh, I'll, we'll do this again and focus in a little more on that game. I want to get back to this season. So uh, from looking at the preseason rankings, the Charlotte 49ers were listed as one of the top, the lowest rated bottom five teams who play D1 football. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure who's actually going to show up on Saturday. They have a lot of guys who have ties to Maryland or ties to Baltimore, ties to uh, St. Francis, and they really seem to have a, an edge and a chip out to play against Maryland. Do you give the 49ers a shot in this game? Uh, no, I don't. I mean, I watched the film. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the Turks have big hopes for this year. I heard Coach Locks talking about it as far as really competing for the Big Ten title. And and that is the case. And as far as I'm concerned, what I've seen on film, um, I, if the Terps go out there and just do what they're supposed to do, then they should they should blow this team out. Personally, looking at things from a defensive standpoint, I think Towson's defensive line is better than Charlotte's defensive line. Um, I could really care less who the guys are that were here that were here at Merlin last year and, and are playing for Charlotte. Obviously they weren't good enough to wear a Terp uniform. Otherwise they would still be here. So I could really care less about that. They're ranked low for a reason. And and when, when you're trying to get up there to be respected, like the Terps are trying to be teams like Charlotte, you, you, you don't worry about all that transfer stuff. You go out there, you play football, you show them who's boss. And it really comes down to the offensive line. If the offensive line goes out there and does what they're supposed to do, the Terps should go out here and absolutely blow this team out. I don't care about the whole St. Francis thing and all of that. It's as simple as this. There are a lot of players that play college football from St. Francis, and a great number of them play big-time Division One football. And I'm not I'm not trying to... You know, I'm not trying to really talk down on Charlotte, but I will just speak facts about just who they are. There's a reason that they were ranked as low as they're ranked. We're the Maryland Terps and we have big plans. This is a team that's on our schedule. This is a team that we should I believe that we should absolutely go out there and blow out and dominate. And I'm going to be honest with you. We have to show up and show dominance in, in this game. This game right here is going to set the course for the remainder of our schedule because after this game, we're playing nothing but bangers. And I know that these guys aren't used to playing against the University of Virginia, so they really don't understand the rivalry. But there is one thing that I found out from the time that I was a freshman that when you play against the University of Virginia, it is a bloodbath. I don't care what the records are. I don't care who's on the field. Four years I played against UVA and four years it was just absolute absolute dynamite uh, tactical nukes proximity minds were going off out there. And if our offensive line doesn't put together a better showing, I'm not too concerned with the Charlotte 49ers. We have to go out there and dominate this team because we have to go out there and beat the University of Virginia. I'm so excited for that UVA game, man. I, I just to be able to call that game from the sideline. It's been years since Maryland and Virginia has played one another. The Terps just have to go out here and get this done. As far as I'm concerned, this should be a bona fide scrimmage. I think that all of our that that you should see a lot of young players get in again this week because we are the Terps and we have big expectations and we can't play down to the level of our opponents. So I expect us to go out here and dominate this team if this team is serious about competing for the Big Ten title. And that I cannot top what was just said. Tune in if you can't make it to College Park. And I heard that the Springsteen concert was canceled because he's sick. So if you had tickets to the Springsteen concert and you can't go to that, hey, come on down to College Park. You'll get to see the Terps play in person. If you can't see it in person, it's on NBC. It is the national game at 730. I saw the new lights at the stadium. The light show is going to be really cool. They have uh, new LED lights. It's going to be fantastic. And hopefully they'll have uh, fireworks on the field and, and score like I think this team can score. This has been Wayne Viner. That is Lamont Jordan. You've been listening to the Turp Talk Football Review this week, brought to you by our friend, the big dog himself, Rick Jacklich and Viner Fourgates. If you have a chance, check out Mason and Ahmed Gafir on the Young Turps podcast. Those kids are just killing it. They have a lot of information. 
a different view than us old guys, but man, they really have a good show. Thanks for listening. We will see you after the game. Check out our post-game show on YouTube and on TerpTalk.com. Thanks for listening.